Hello and welcome to Heart of England Wildlife Park's second conservation webinar. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you this evening to our bat conservation talk. And having had a sneak preview of this talk yesterday evening, I'm really excited about uh, you guys hearing from Libby Cropper, who is a professional ecologist and also a bat scientist. It's an incredibly here at the Heart of England Wildlife Park at the moment. We're currently uh, preparing all of our crowdfunder rewards, which will be going out to our supporters at the end of this week. And it's going to be a busy day for us tomorrow. Since we've uh, announced our preferred site, we've had an overwhelming outpouring of support from the local community, which has obviously been really reassuring. And you know, whenever you plan a new development, there are initially going to be some concerns. And, you know, I just want to reassure people that as a wildlife park, our primary uh, focus will always be on uh, native wildlife as well as exotic wildlife. And whilst going through this planning application uh, process, we'll be looking to create a biodiversity and ecological net gain for the site, which we eventually build Heart of England Wildlife Park on. And of all the sites we've looked at, um, you know, we've always come across some wildlife. Whenever you're looking essentially at a blank canvas, there's going to be some wildlife which makes that um, area a home, a habitat. And on some of the sites that we've looked at, we have seen uh, bats flying around uh, in the evening. We've also seen other native species as well. And of course, we want to safeguard and protect their environment and, of course, enhance it. Now, when you think of uh, this time of year and you naturally think of Halloween, one of the first animals that you might think of, of course, is the bat. And unfortunately, this year, bats have had a bit of bad press because of the coronavirus pandemic. But for me, bats are one of the most fascinating types of animal. And there are so many different species of bat around the world. And I genuinely can't wait to hear more from Livy about the different bat species that she's worked with in a professional capacity. So without further ado, I would love to hand over to uh, Libby, who will talk you through uh, a little bit about bat ecology and conservation. And at the end of the session, we'll come back and uh, I'll see you again and we'll happily answer any of your questions. Over to you, Libby. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, really excited to talk to everybody about bat ecology and conservation today. Uh, Martin gave me a quick introduction there, but I'll just move on to a little bit about myself and what I'm going to talk about today. So I studied a degree in international wildlife biology at the University of South Wales and this gave me a really good basis to understand uh, about wildlife species all over the world and I had quite a, a broad um, introduction to wildlife there but I found a particular interest and a particular passion for bat species um, and I actually wrote my dissertation on bats uh, at the end of my time there. So following that, I have been a part of the bat science team with an organisation called Operation Wallacea, who conduct research all over the world. And then I have also been a professional ecologist at a firm called Arup for about five years now. Um, they are an engineering firm, but we have an in-house uh, environmental department that ensure that any kind of development is delivered to the best possible standard of kind of environmental uh, benefit as, as well as um, delivering those developments. So yeah, I have, I have been working with bats for quite some time now and um, really enjoying it. So I'd love to share a bit of that passion with all of you. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what a bat is and why they're important and following on from that, how we can help bats, what kind of actions we can take ourselves um, and that's going to be followed up with some examples of bat conservation efforts, both overseas and in the UK. First of all, what is a bat then? Um, the scientific name for bats is Chiroptera, which literally translates as the hand wings. And that's because their bones have specially adapted over time in order to become a wing. There's a, a membrane that stretches in between each of the finger bones and therefore this allows them to fly. They're the only man mammals that are capable of true flight, which is essentially um, powered flight. So they don't glide like sugar gliders or flying squirrels. They actually use their muscles to generate energy that powers them through the air. Um, and that's something that I find really amazing about this group of animals. They, they can do something that, that 
no other group of mammals can and, and it kind of really in, in a really impressive way. There are broadly two kind of categories of bats um, and you might recognize the micro bats more as they're the ones that we find in the UK. Um, these are the small insectivorous, typically insectivorous bats that can echolocate and they use their echolocation to be able to uh, see in the dark um, in some way. They can actually generate almost like an image using their voice um, that they can interpret. And then we have the, the megabats as well, which are kind of more the tropics, um, fruit bats and so on. Um, now, recent research has actually discovered that some of those little micro bats are actually more closely related to the megabats. So we actually have two regroupings now called the pteropodiforms and the vespiculioniforms. Um, but I'll go uh, into a little bit more detail about individual species of bats later on that kind of um, explains what all the different niches of bats are. There are, I can't talk about all of the species of bats in this talk, unfortunately, because they are actually a group of around 1300 species. Um, that's often, a lot of people don't realise just how many species of bats there are, um, but that 1300 actually constitutes around 20% of all mammal species. So bats are a really, really important component of biodiversity. Um, and that's why it's important to conserve them. Because there are so many different types of bats, they occupy all kinds of different niches. And as a result, they have a really wide variety of diets from fruit and nectar, um, in some locations, frogs and fish, um, and all kinds of different insects. Through consuming these fruit or insects, they provide really important ecosystem services. And I'll talk a bit later about what ecosystem services are, but this kind of comes down to things like pest control, pollination and seed dispersal. Some people are quite surprised to find out that bats are not very closely related to rodents. In fact, in many languages, the word for bats directly translates to um, something to do with a mouse. So for example, Fledermaus in uh, German or Schwebsli in French is uh, flying mouse and bald mouse. Um, but they're not flying mice and they're not bald mice. Um, they are actually not very closely related to mice at all. Um, one of the ways in which they're different is they're very slow breeding. And that's why bats can be threatened because they can only produce one offspring a year. Um, and this is partly down to the fact that they have much longer lifespans. They, they take longer to reach sexual maturity. And then as a result, some bats can live for sort of 30, 40 years. In fact, the oldest recorded bat um, was a species called Brant's bat. Uh, you can actually find Brant's bat within the UK. Um, and the oldest known uh, Brant's bat was at least 41 years old. So, when we talk about conservation, I think it's really important to kind of bring it back to the basic principles of what is a species and what is biodiversity. Um, basically, because I think lots of people think they understand about species and biodiversity. They're words that get thrown around quite a lot these days, um, especially words like ecosystem get thrown around to describe things that don't necessarily mean anything to do with an ecosystem. So I'm going to just run over these kind of basic concepts to start off with, just to refresh all of our memory. There are actually many definitions of what a species is. Um, and this is kind of changing all the time as science develops. But one of the most common um, accepted theories right now is that a species is a group of organisms where breeding can result in a viable offspring. Um, and a viable offspring is basically uh, a new individual that can survive to adulthood and breed itself. So it's all about passing on of genetic material down generations. This can often be confirmed with new tech technologies in genetic testing. Um, there are often specific markers within an animal's genome that can show whether it is closely related to another or not. Um, and that is one new way that we can use to kind of define what a species means. Um, and when we talk about biodiversity in conservation, most often we're referring to um, biological diversity in terms of species. So we're talking about how many species are present within an ecosystem. 
Um, the importance of species diversity is basically that the more complex an ecosystem is, the more resilient it is. If you have lots of different types of pollinators, lots of different types of predators, then you have um, an ecosystem that is able to operate without human intervention, basically. Um, and apart from that, it also creates the most kind of amazing habitats that we like to enjoy. Um, we like to see, you know, butterflies and um, all kinds of different bees and many different species in an area when we go outside and, and that kind of builds a picture of a, of a healthy ecosystem, one that has many different species present. And conservation aims to protect that. There are other ways of measuring biodiversity and one that I thought I'd just drop in now is that you can also measure biodiversity by biomass. Um, so if we weighed all of the animals on planet Earth, we would see that only around 3% of that mass or that weight would be wild animals and the other 97% is human or domestic animals like cows, sheep, cats and dogs. So it's really important to recognize the impact that humans have on the environment as well. So what do people know about biodiversity then? I said that I think some people maybe don't necessarily understand biodiversity sometimes. Um, and I just wanted to introduce why I think that. So usually at this point in a talk, I would have a little chat with the audience and find out what um, people know and that wasn't an option this time uh, with our online webinar so we I've decided to send out a little questionnaire beforehand very very quick um, just to see what species come to mind for people and I think that kind of indicates um, what people know about biodiversity just because we tend to see some biases in the in the kind of species that people actually know about so um, just one thing to start off with there was little knowledge of invertebrates, for example. So despite the fact that invertebrates make up 95% of all animal diversity, only three out of 155 named species were invertebrates. Um, I think potentially there's a misunderstanding of what a species is as well. Uh, some people named groups of animals, such as reptiles or whales, um, and these aren't kind of individual species. An example of an individual species would be adder or blue whale. Um, and potentially under, not understanding what is native to the UK. So um, this questionnaire may have been answered by people from outside of the UK, um, but even so, the fact that species that come to mind are things like grey squirrel and rabbit, um, that as British species, that makes me think that potentially people aren't clear on what a native species is, although I didn't actually specify um, in the question that it had to be a native British species, so I could have been a little clearer there. Um, I think there's also a bias towards um, large kind of what I would call glamorous animals, such as lions, tigers, bears, and so on. Um, often a lot of the answers uh, included these, even when it, they didn't include um, sort of local species, um, predicting that most of my responses came from the UK. Um, and also, even though, like I mentioned earlier, there is a bias towards mammals and bats make up 20% of mammals, not very many people mention bats at all. So I'm kind of, what this all comes down to is drawing down to this idea that bats are kind of underrepresented and maybe not very well understood. Funnily enough, um, around 10 out of the 31 people who responded to my survey could name five species of bat. But I think I suspect that that's mostly because I know a lot of ecologists and people who listen to me ramble on about bats. So um, I think that's potentially a little better than the, than the general population. Um, so if people know about biodiversity and they might have a few misconceptions, they might also have misconceptions about bats. And I certainly think this is true through the work that I've done. Um, so many people ask me lots of really good questions about bats, but it goes to show that they might not have a good understanding of bats in the first place. Um, so one thing that I hear very often is that people consider bats as pests and they don't want them living anywhere near them. In fact, if you Google bat conservation, you get about 45 million results. And if you Google bat removal, um, you get more than double the number of results. 
this is really interesting to me because I think it shows that at the moment people are still looking for more information on how to get bats away from them rather than how to kind of live alongside bats peacefully. Another misconception is that all bats suck blood or all bats are vampire bats. Um, there are actually species of vampire bat that do exist, but this is only three species out of the 1300 I mentioned earlier, um, and none of them live in the UK. So um, you don't need to worry about being bitten by, by a vampire bat. However, even in countries where they do live, uh, like in Central and South America, they still kind of prefer large um, large animals to take blood from, such as cows and, and things like that. So it, it's really not something that people need to spend too much time worrying about. Um, another misconception perhaps that people have is that all bats carry rabies. People are often very worried about the idea of encountering bats because they see them as dangerous um, due to the viruses and, and things that they may carry. Um, whilst rabies is definitely present in some bats um, and bats are able to carry rabies, uh, it is something that people don't necessarily need to worry about as much as they might think. Um, the prevalence of rabies within many bat species is very low and in some bat species it's not present at all. And additionally, the vast majority of rabies cases do come from uh, animals that people come into contact with far more often, like for example dogs and cats. Um, rabies transmission from, from bat to human is, is extremely low um, and it's kind of worth worth remembering that if you don't come into contact with a bat you cannot catch rabies from them so if you don't touch them um, and you're not provoking them to bite you then, then in the vast majority of cases people shouldn't have a problem at all. Um, this is a good point to mention if you do ever find a bat in the wild and you need to give it some help because maybe it's on the ground um, you can do so only under kind of circumstances where you have gloves or something to protect your hands um, and the only people who would handle bats on a regular basis are people with a rabies vaccine um, and also the appropriate training to do so. Um, coronavirus is a hot topic at the moment, obviously. Um, we're all kind of very concerned about where the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has originated from and understandably so. However, the theory that coronavirus has originated in bats is actually still not proven, even though most people tend to use it as a big headline. Um, I think the uh, relatedness of the current coronavirus uh, that's circling, circul circulating in the human population um, is about 96% similar to one that's found um, in a particular species of Asian horseshoe bat. So whilst there is a level of relatedness that makes it likely that it could have come from a bat, this still actually hasn't been proven. Um, and it's and it's potentially not the link at all, or there could be even intermediate vectors, um, so other wildlife species in between bats and humans. So it's kind of important to remember, again, if we don't come into contact with bats, um, then the risk of disease being transmitted to us from them is extremely low. Um, another thing to note is potentially we as humans are posing more of a risk to bats from coronavirus right now because current IUCN guidance, guidance does actually say that um, based on current data we could be transmitting coronavirus to other mammals um, including bats so that's also something worth bearing in mind. Um, finally by far the most common misconception that I've heard about bats is that they are blind. Um, this is not true or no species that I know of. Um, they do tend to have pretty good night vision um, particularly the fruit bats, they use um, sight, sound and smell to navigate in the dark and find their food. Obviously fruit bats eat stationary food, so um, insect eating bats have come up with, and other types of bats that hunt prey, have come up with a separate system, of course that's echolocation, that helps them to gain a picture of um, the surroundings around them in the dark. I have some examples here of echolocation. Um, you can listen to bat calls using specialised microphones on um, devices called bat detectors. And um, I just want to show you how different um, these, uh, these calls actually sound, um, because each species can be identified from their call. 
um, because they all sound so different. So I'll just start this one. Hopefully you can hear it. So that bat on the left is a pipistrelle. And if you can hear the horseshoe that's on the right hand side, you'll hear just how different they are. So over time, you can learn to listen out for bats and identify them purely from their call without even, to have, even having them sort of right up in front of you. Um, and this is a really important development in bat conservation because it's allowed us to monitor bats a lot more easily. Um, so why do we need to conserve bats anyway? Um, I guess you could ask the question, what have bats ever done for us? Well, um, I think I mentioned earlier the kind of ecosystem services that they offer, um, and this comes down to pollination, seed dispersal, consumption of pests and disease vectors as well. Um, one fact that I love to share with people is that tequila is almost entirely pollinated by bats. So um, you wouldn't get your agave, uh, your agave syrup or your tequila um, if, you, if you didn't have bats to thank for that. Um, in fact, there are also non-food crops that um, rely on bats for kind of pollination or seed dispersal um, that still have cultural significance to people. Um, some examples of this would be the African baobab or the Asian banyan tree. Um, and there are many other different types of yeah, crops and timber that people are reliant on um, that bats really do kind of protect. And if you add up all of these Kind of ecosystem services. Um, some estimates have decided that these kind of services would be worth around $53 billion a year and that's just in the USA. So whilst it's really hard to quantify that number and have kind of a firm, you know, this many bats eat this many insects and save this much um, rice or, or what have you, um, it does give us a good kind of indication of the fact that um, conservation is beneficial to humans. Conserving bat species is absolutely beneficial economically to humans. So people often talk about spending money on conservation when in reality it's about saving money in the long term. Um, apart from that, obviously conservationists and many other people just believe that species have an inherent right to life and um, enjoy seeing species in their natural environment and believe that they, they have just as right much of a right to be on planet Earth as humans and therefore we should respect them and um, support them in, in that sense. There are still sadly some threats to bats though, um, in particular things like climate change that threaten many species, um, but also things like deforestation and mining. Bats are particularly susceptible to mining because they do tend to live in underground um, environments like cave systems um, and that can mean that their roofs can be destroyed really really quickly if they're not um, properly accounted for. Also direct persecution is becoming more of a problem particularly when um, bats get bad press um, or there's misinformation circulating about bats. Um, this can be a cause for concern as basically people actively want to go and kill bats um, in countries where bats are much larger, they tend to be hunted for meat as well. Um, and in countries like the UK, where there's a very high level of um, cats and other domestic animals that can predate bats, this can actually be quite a significant risk as well. Um, there was a recent study um, that was circulated by the Bat Conservation Trust in the UK um, that kind of proved that injuries from cats were particularly hard for bats to recover from as well. So the damage that cats do um, makes it very hard for bats to return to the wild. Um, in countries such as America, there are also diseases like white nose syndrome, which is a fungus that affects the respiratory system of bats. And increasingly, things like disturbance can actually cause a problem for bats. So for example, where people are collecting guano, which is um, bat poo, uh, it can be used as a fertilizer and also in some explosives. If you have repeated um, visits to a good quality roost, they may be forced out. They may choose to leave that roost 
um, in favour of less good quality roosts um, and that can also pose a problem for, for breeding populations of bats. As mentioned, um, the breeding populations are particularly significant, so mothers and babies because um, bats do reproduce quite slowly and therefore um, are much more susceptible to kind of population crashes if, if maternity roosts are damaged. So how can bats be protected then? Obviously in every single area of the world, in all kinds of different countries, and even in different regions of specific countries, the answer can be different because the threats are different. But there are some kind of broad um, measures that are really good uh, places to start for bat conservation. Um, habitat protection, for example, if you designate um, kind of a nature reserve or a wildlife protected area, um, this doesn't just protect the bats, but also all of the species around them and the habitat around them. So this is one of the best ways to conserve bats. In the UK, legislation of individual bat roosts has also been very useful in bat conservation because it protects the, each individual bat where they're roosting, where they're sheltering. Um, and that's been really important for bats in the UK. Educating the general public so that bats and humans can live alongside each other safely um, is also key and kind of leading on from that better journalism so that we don't run with these big kind of headlines that just say bats are bad. They kind of maybe are a bit more nuanced and understand that uh, bats can be beneficial to humans as, as well. Um, and finally, one that I think is, I personally think is really, really important, and that's listening to and incorporating local knowledge into conservation solutions. You must be um, culturally, culturally sensitive when you, when you have conservation interventions, because often it is people who live alongside bats who know best what works for them and what's going to work best for the bats, because um, these situations can be pretty complex. Zoos can be a really important tool in bat conservation as well. Um, in particular, I'd like to raise the case of the Livingston's fruit bat. There are only around 1,200 of these um, remaining in the wild, so not very many at all um, in terms of, of a whole population. But um, Bristol Zoo and the University of Bristol have been working on a pretty successful breeding program for this species. Um, alongside kind of genetic studies and additional ecological studies that are helping them to understand um, the ecology of Livingston's fruit bat um, and therefore hopefully returning um, individuals to the wild um, to support wild populations in time. Um, at least 207 bat species are at risk of extinction. So um, you would think that they would be a key species for zoos to target. However, unfortunately, only 2.6% of all bat species are actually kept in zoos. And they're not always necessarily the ones that are in greatest need of conservation intervention. So it's approximately 16% of bat species that are threatened, but this could be as high as 40%. And the reason for this discrepancy is essentially because sometimes the data isn't available. Lots of bat species haven't been studied. So it's hard to assess whether they are common or uh, vulnerable to extinction. So you can see that's quite a big gap in between the 2.6% of bat species that are kept in zoos and the 16% of bat species that are threatened. Um, so it would be really good to see zoos incorporating more bat conservation um, over time as well. But it is also important to note that this is kind of a general trend for mammals and birds. Often the species that are kept in zoos aren't always the ones that are the most threatened. They might be the ones that are most available for the zoos um, to get hold of. Um, you can see an, another example of this would be, for example, the wolf and the doll. So many people know that the grey wolf um, can be locally threatened by things like hunting. However, overall, it is um, least concern on the IUCN red list. Uh, whereas spe species like the doll, which is basically an Asian wolf or an Asian canid related to dogs and foxes, um, actually isn't kept in very many um, zoo collections at all. So there's certainly gaps that zoos can help to address. Uh, that's just a close-up picture of the Livingston's fruit bat, um, one of the individuals kept at Bristol Zoo there, just because I think it looks really gorgeous with the, the gold fur in the sunlight that you can see on the left-hand side there. 
Um, so whilst zoos are a really important tool um, in situ, uh, conservation is also really important as well. Um, in particular, uh, oh, in situ uh, conservation is basically conservation that happens in the bat's actual habitat, like out in the field. Um, and in particular, successful um, in situ conservation is the kind of conservation where habitat is protected. And again, like I mentioned earlier, local communities are worked with um, so that their needs are met as well. Um, I've list listed on the left hand side a couple of examples of um, organisations and charities that have delivered some really effective uh, bat conservation in the past or are monitoring bat populations all across the world. But the one I'd particularly like to talk about today is the Flying Fox Conservation Fund, uh, which is based in Indonesia. Um, and that's because um, they work to protect a species that I've actually managed to encounter in the wild. Um, and that species of this is the Sulawesi flying fox. And you can see that species on the right hand side. It's really gorgeous. It's quite a large fruit bat. Um, it's pictured there in a fig tree. So you can see it's been eating some figs. Um, they've got these lovely big eyes, big ears and a little white spot on their nose. They're very, very charming animals. Um, however, as it's such a large bat, it's quite desirable in the bushmeat trade. Um, this bat is vulnerable to extinction on the IUCN red list um, and in some parts of its range it's been hunted almost to extinction or, or it's even missing um, in certain areas. So for example in North Sulawesi it's now considered to be locally extirpated which is basically extinct in that specific region. Um, the consumption of Sulawesi flying fox is kind of fairly moderate. It's not um, people's first choice of food, but it does increase tenfold during Christian holidays when it becomes more desirable as part of kind of celebratory feasts. So um, uh, Easter, Christmas and so on, because there is quite a big Christian population on Sulawesi. Um, however, the Flying Fox Conservation Fund has reported that the species is making a really strong return in some areas of Sulawesi. Um, and there's one particular village that they've worked with where local people have planted fruit trees to attract large colonies of this bat. And they also charge small fees to visitors passing through and that's to kind of deter bat hunters from coming in from further afield. They also report that their rice production has increased since well, kind of welcoming the bats, which is really amazing um, because it's benefited them and it shows the importance of local conservation and local solutions. When I observed this species on the island I was working on, Bhutan, which is ad adjacent to Sulawesi, um, I actually found that um, we were able to record it for the first kind of first formal recording or scientific recording of that species for a really long time. It was around um, 10 years since it had been last scientifically recorded. Um, the, on Bhutan Island, the majority of the population are Muslim and therefore um, they prefer not to eat the bats, which they consider haram. So potentially that's why these kind of fragment populations are still remaining. Um, but they are they are quite elusive and hard to find. So thanks very much to Josh Angora, my colleague, uh, who took this photo, because um, this bat was hanging out just right above our hammocks, but my camera wasn't quite up to the job. So he did a really great job of, of uh, confirming that record. So why did I choose to study bats in Indonesia? Um, well, of the 1300 species worldwide, most are distributed in the tropics. The closer you go to the equator, the higher diverse you get. That's a general trend and it's also true for bat species. And again, um, bats are a really key part of biodiversity and uh, mammal diversity in Southeast Asia. Um, and around a third of all mammal species in Southeast Asia are bats. They're also really good biological indicators and what this basically means that is that if you see a decline in bat populations it can kind of be um, proceed um, decline in general biodiversity so um, bats can help us to catch problems early and ensure that um, good conservation interventions are implemented and unfortunately at least 40 percent of Southeast Asian bats are either threatened or a higher classification on the IUCN red list. So they're well worth um, kind of preserving and they do need action now. 
Um, they've also generally been overlooked until recent years, but the good news is that modern technology developments help us to study bats. Um, obviously, they are quite hard to study. They only fly at night, um, and echolocation is far above the kind of human range of hearing. Um, and yeah, they're, they're generally quite hard to kind of trap or get, get um, a good picture of in the hand. So yeah, these new developments in, in kind of microphone technology and so on have been really, really important in helping to, to understand and therefore conserve bat species. Um, one particular piece of uh, really cool uh, research on Indonesian bats and kind of Southeast Asian bats um, that I want to mention is a paper on harmonic hopping from uh, Steve Roster and Tigger Kingston. This came out in 2004, but it's still um, a really important study that um, has taught us a lot about um, kind of evolution in general, as well as uh, bats in the region. So you can see on the right hand side a picture of a large, large eared horseshoe bat. Um, and this bat is interesting because it essentially has three size morphs. These different morphs are actually able to call at different frequencies. So there's a, a small uh, bat which has a high pitch call, a medium bat which has a kind of medium call, and a large bat which has a very low pitched call. Um, and this is basically because they have different diets. So they are looking for different insects. Some might be, the small ones might be looking for mosquitoes and flies and the larger ones looking for beetles and big moths. Um, and what this is essentially telling us is that they are adapting. We can see a snapshot of evolution in progress. Um, and over time, uh, selective breeding is occurring within these morphs. So because the bats can only hear the other bats that are calling at the same frequency as them, the small ones are getting smaller and the large ones getting larger and the moderate ones um, are only interbreeding with, with the other moderate ones. Um, and genetic studies have shown that the species hasn't yet split into three separate species, but it probably will over multiple generations. Um, this is a really similar concept to that seen in Darwin's finches. So where the finches eat different foods, they develop different beaks, they take on different forms um, over time. And this is basically kind of one step before um, that. So we're, we're seeing actual evolution happening right before our eyes, which I find really, really cool. The reason that um, I chose to do work on Bhutan Island is because I was working with a group called Operation Wallacea, who I think I mentioned before. Um, Operation Wallacea or OPWAL are a research organisation that are based in the UK, but undertake studies all over the world and especially in tropical regions. Um, they've been working in Bhutan for over 15 years now, um, and that has allowed them to successfully create many really good quality long term data sets. Uh, Bhutan was chosen by Operation Wallacea and the project has been so successful because of a few key, um, key, few key elements about the, about the island. Um, for one, it's quite an understudied and underfunded area within the region, so there's lots still to learn um, and, you know, very important information that's just kind of waiting to be uncovered. Um, additionally, the local communities on Bhutan were really keen to be involved. They love getting involved with um, conservation intervention and working with people from all over the world. Um, and they've been really, really welcoming and had really great ideas. Um, additionally, there are still untouched fragments of forest on Bhutan. Um, this means that there's plenty of habitat that's totally ready to be saved, um, totally ready be, to be protected. Um, and this has mainly come from the fact that it's not as suitable for palm oil farming as some of the adjacent islands. Um, palm oil farming is um, a really big threat to all of Indonesia and, and in particular this region of Indonesia, um, the Wallacea region. So essentially deforestation still is somewhat of a threat and there are other thre threats such as mining. Their main export is asphalt, but the habitat on Bhutan Island is, it is still possible to preserve that through conservation research and um, subsequent action. I've had um, different focuses each time I've been out to do research with Operation Wallacea. 
and I just wanted to run uh, through those a little bit now. Um, in 2014, I was working alongside a team where we were focused on creating something called a call library, which is basically recording all of the echolocation calls with specialized mics, called microphones called bat detectors. And then we can identify many species of the insect eating bats from that data. So that was all kind of about documenting those species. In 2015, we decided to create a formal publication which listed all of the insectivorous and um, fruit eating species present on the island, um, or as many species as we could possibly find. Um, and therefore, we used um, a much wider range of methods that year, including um, kind of physical trapping of the bats. Um, fruit eating bats don't echolocate, so obviously, we can't survey them in that kind of um, specialized way. And in 2018, we aim to update the species inventory with previously unrecorded species, things that we'd missed or things where new data was available that kind of indicated to us that there might be um, additional species present. Um, and in particular, that was data that could help us distinguish between very similar looking species, or this is also known as a cryptic species. Um, so we took morphometric data from a lot of the bats. Um, and that's essentially kind of measurements, um, some kind of part of the body of the bat uh, that can then be compared to other species to see if you have multiple species or one species. So kind of breaking that down to an example, is there a particular finger bone within a bat's wing um, where we can measure the length and then when we analyse that data, it can be used to separate species that otherwise look exactly the same. So we might have two bats that we think they are the same species, but when we measure this particular finger bone, we realize, no, there's actually multiple species here. This kind of data collection is really useful because it's quite difficult to get permission to collect genetic samples in Indonesia. So it's really helped us to separate out the number of species and get a better understanding of the bat biodiversity on Busan Island. Um, Following this, obviously, we want to publish our data. It's really important to share what we've learned with others. And that was why it was very important for us to make sure that any of our publications were going to be open source. So we had a, a formal written paper which kind of described the bat species and then this photographic guide to sit alongside it that illustrates those descriptions. Um, being open source, it means it's accessible for other researchers in the area. Um, and they can build on the work that we've done and kind of um, share knowledge in that way. Um, the paper is actually due to be updated very soon, um, hopefully being submitted before the end of this year. Um, so we also identified quite a few potential research opportunities for the future. Um, there's still a lot more to learn about, about the bats in this region. Um, for example, Hardwick's woolly bat is a species that occurs throughout Southeast Asia. And as you can see on the right hand side, um, I've borrowed someone else's picture for this. Um, you can see that these bats have symbiotic relationships with pitcher plants. Um, and the way that that works is that the pitcher plants attract insects, the bats receive shelter and eat the insects, and then um, the plants actually digest the bat poo um, when, the, when the bats are roosting inside them. So it's beneficial to the, to the pitcher plant and to the bats. Um, however, when we analysed our morphometric data that I mentioned earlier um, with regard to this particular species, we realised that um, the measurements don't exactly match um, individuals of this species from other areas um, based on the data that we have available. So potentially, is this bat a morph that's found just on this island or a subspecies, or could it even potentially be a distinct new species? Genetic testing and further data collection is going to help us to understand um, when we go out again in future, and therefore we can better protect these bats if we understand what species they are, what niches they occupy. Um, this bat is really worth protecting too. Uh, it's one of my favourite species on the island, to be honest. I, I try not to have favourites, but it's quite hard when they're missed you. Um, it actually smells like curry or, or musk. It's really quite a stinky bat. 
um, even though it's so small and it weighs just three grams when it's fully grown, which makes it close to one of the smallest species in the world. Um, just as a kind of point of reference, uh, three grams is less than a single grape typically weighs. So they really are just, just fluffy little grapes with wings. Um, similarly, we realized that these large fruit bats that we'd observed um, across all across the island had previously been identified as one species, but it could actually be multiple species that look very similar, behave quite similarly, similarly and even roost together. Um, it's quite likely that they are actually a species complex, um, which is what we call basically a group of species where we haven't quite ironed out all the details yet and um, we, we're kind of still grouping them up in one species. Um, and they may all look very similar, but they might not actually be interbreeding even though they live alongside each other. But again, genetic testing and kind of further morphometric analysis would help us to unpick the story there. Um, 2018 also helped us to identify some new sites to monitor in future um, with species that had previously not been recorded for some time. Uh, for example, the lesser false vampire bat that's in the left hand picture there, it's not an actual vampire bat. Um, and the little long fingered bat on the right hand side, um, they hadn't been formally recorded on the island for quite some years. So now that we've identified new sites where they live, we can do better at um, monitoring them over long over long term periods. So um, bringing it a bit closer to home since most of the audience will be based in the UK. Um, there are many fascinating species in the rest of the world, but it's also really important to remember that we have 17 fascinating species at home um, in the UK too, and, and they need our help and support as well. Um, the UK is actually one of the most species depleted countries in the world. We've lost far more wildlife species than, than on average throughout the rest of the world, um, and not many people realise that. So the 17 species of bat that are present in the UK have all unfortunately suffered declines historically. They've all had population drops, um, but it is now thought that many of those species are stable or recovering, but that's not the end of the story. We need to keep up that effort and um, make sure that that ongoing picture is built to, to continue bat conservation um, over time and, and potentially have full recoveries of all species. This is quite a challenge though. Um, for example, one of the species, the greater mouse-eared bat, has just one individual remaining that we know of in the UK. Um, this bat does tend to um, appear in Kent every so often, um, and we're not entirely sure on where it goes the rest of the time, but unfortunately it doesn't ever occur with a mate or um, as part of a colony, it is just one individual bat that's remaining. It is a species that's present on mainland Europe as well, but um, it would be it's going to be a really sad day when we realise that um, that species no longer exists in the UK at all. Um, all UK bat species are insectivorous, so they all echolocate, as I was talking about earlier. Um, they live in trees and also buildings and bridges, depending on the species. And we don't know a lot about where bats choose to hibernate in the UK, choose to hibernate in winter. We know generally they tend to go underground, so caves, mines and tunnels. But um, often we're not actually able to track back to those sites very well. There's still quite a lot to learn in that regard. We do know that bats are really reliant on woodlands for shelter and for foraging. So um, places that have lots of insects are obviously the best for them to hunt. Um, but most species are quite territorial about where they hunt. And so um, they need to spread out. They might roost in woodlands, but they need to spread out a bit throughout the night when they emerge from their roosts. So they like to travel through the landscape, in particular following habitats like uh, that are linear, like rivers and hedgerows. So there's actually quite a big patchwork of different habitats that are really valuable to bats. So there's quite a lot of um, different aspects that we need to conserve when we're, when we're thinking about bat conservation. Um, one of the largest um, kind of forces for bat conservation in the UK is a fantastic charity called the Bat Conservation Trust. And they coordinate a national network of volunteers to deliver um, local and national scale projects. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those in a moment. Um, there are also organisations that have a really important role to play 
um, such as the Wildlife Trust, RSPB, and sometimes local councils can do um, conservation interventions as well, uh, particularly in terms of habitat management. And then there are also local back groups. Um, and if you are local to the Heart of England Wildlife Park, um, I can tell you that your local back groups would be Worcestershire Back Group, Brumbats, and Warwickshire Back Group. Um, they would be your kind of three nearest. Um, and they have all delivered some really great um, conservation um, actions over the years. Um, so the Bat Conservation Trust or the BCT are a fantastic charity that have worked really hard to achieve the stabilisation and even recovery of many bat species in the UK. Um, if you ever find a bat, the best thing to do is to call them. They have a dedicated um, helpline called the National Bat Helpline um, and they'll advise you on how to contain the bat and will get a volunteer bat carer to come and collect the bat from you. This actually results in hundreds of injured and sick bats being released back into the wild each and every year. So it's um, as a kind of overall picture is actually a really useful tool for bat conservation. The National Bat Monitoring Programme also collects huge amount of data from volunteers who do field surveys, woodland surveys, wetland surveys. Um, and this data allows them to track the population trends of at least 11 of the 17 UK species. Um, the reason that there's a bit of a gap for some of the other species is where they're particularly elusive and, and basically hard to collect data on. Um, it can be harder to form um, long-term population trends for, for a few of the species. Um, but the data that is collected is really valuable for local back groups and other bodies to kind of focus their conservation actions each year. Um, they also, the BCT also run a number of projects that have engaged bat specialists to monitor for specific individual species, um, such as the Nethusias pipistrelle project. The Nethusias pipistrelle is um, a migratory species of bat and it does cross over to Britain from multiple other countries. Um, one individual was even recently traced from Latvia to Spain, so they can travel really quite long distances. Uh, so that, that's one fascinating species that uh, the BCT has contributed to conservation for before. Um, and they also work in partnership with a number of other charities um, to, de to deliver uh, Back from the Brink project, um, which uh, is basically looking at the grey long-eared bat that's now mostly restricted only to Devon in England um, and some parts of uh, South Wales as well. So um, back group activities are what, um, if you're a beginner, you might be most likely to get involved with if you join your local back group. Um, and just to give a picture of what those activities might be, uh, most back groups deliver quite a lot of back walks and back surveys. Um, they deliver public education and talks a bit like this one, or maybe going into a bit more detail about individual species. Um, they also do quite a lot of targeted um, efforts targeted um, effort on bat monitoring in terms of kind of actually physically trapping bats. Um, and I've given some examples there of sites in Worcestershire where uh, bats are trapped and bat boxes have been installed and also get monitored. Um, this is actually an example on the left hand side of a brown long-eared bat uh, maternity colony. So that's 10 females all fussed up in a bat box there in the Nap and Paper Mill Reserve. Um, and they may other work, also work with other organisations like biological record centres or land managers. Um, so just to mention, uh, the back groups may not be as active as they normally are at the moment. And that's unfortunately due to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, bats will, back groups will be avoiding handling bats wherever possible. At the moment, um, the advice is that humans should only uh, handle bats in a kind of life-saving situation for the bat. So um, as well as avoiding large gatherings of people, um, there's not much that people can do outdoors right now, especially coming into winter when bats are going into hibernation anyway. Um, it's still absolutely worth getting in touch with your local bat group though to see if they have any tips um, for, for example, making your garden a bit nicer for bats or even they might be running some interesting talks over the winter. Um, so the Bat Conservation Trust and your local bat group should always be your first port of call if you want to get involved in UK bat conservation. 
If you can't get involved with any BCT projects right now, you can still help them to fundraise by visiting the gift section of their website, um, where they offer a really massive selection actually of products made by small businesses. So from jewelry to clothing to mugs, um, and you can maybe pop uh, pop them on their Christmas list for people, get some stocking fillers from there uh, in order to support them. And you can support your local back group by joining as a member. And it's usually only about £10 a year per person or per household. Um, so it's a really, um, in a normal year, it's a really affordable way of getting to know other people, getting outside um, and all the other benefits that come alongside um, actually conserving bat populations as well. You don't need to be involved with massive projects in order to make a difference though. There are many really important things you can do at home for bat conservation, um, particularly if you have any outdoor space that you can make better for bats. Um, introducing uh, plants that flower at night, um, especially native species like campions, mallows, honeysuckle and dianthus, um, or even um, non-native species that people typically keep in their gardens like prim primrose, tobacco, wisteria and jasmine, all of these can attract bugs that bats like to feast on in your garden. You can also encourage bugs by introducing bug hotels and of course even bat boxes for bats to actually roost in um, and you can buy these online or even create your own. There's actually quite a lot of guidance out, out there on how to do that now. Uh, most importantly, potentially, uh, you can bring your, if you have a cat, you can bring them in overnight or particularly at dusk, which is when bats are emerging from their roost and really at their most vulnerable. Um, if you're interested in echolocation, these days you can find secondhand bat detectors such as bat boxes and echometer touches really quite cheaply online. So you can sit out in your garden over summer and tune in to your new visitors that you've attracted with all your bug hotels and your night flowering plants. Um, and you can observe them actually pretty easily, especially just before it gets dark. That's the best time to see bats in your garden um, or at your kind of local outdoor space. If you want to learn even more about bats, there are loads of great books and field guides available to help get you started. Um, there was even a documentary on horseshoe bats on the BBC this week that you can watch back on iPlayer. And the BCT, again, they have a bat chat podcast which covers all different aspects of bat conservation and has been really interesting uh, to the ones that I've listened to so far. Um, one thing to remember is because bats are legally protected in the UK, you mustn't handle them or disturb them unless you, you really need to do so. Um, in fact, it's illegal to, to pick up a bat unless you have um, a reason, for example, trying to save its life. Again, you also want to protect yourself as well um, because bats can, can carry some particular types of diseases that would be potentially detrimental to humans. Um, many bat conservation projects actually require special licenses to permit handling and disturbance. So if you want to help bats but you're unsure um, whether what you want to do to help them is legal, you can always seek advice from the Bat Conservation Trust. People who are experts that handle bats on a regular basis will be trained in how to do this properly. Um, they'll always wear gloves um, and other necessary PPE and they'll always have their rabies vaccination up to date. Um, and there I've just dropped the number as well for the BCT helpline if you ever find a bat. Um, it's just at the bottom of that slide there, but you can Google it and find it online too. Thank you very much for listening. Um, that's all I have to say today, but I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Livy. Um, as you know, I could genuinely listen to you talk about bats all day. We've had some really fantastic um, comments uh, coming through and some really good questions as well, which I'm going to put to you if you uh, don't mind. Um, I really enjoyed the part about um, the Sulawesi flying fox out in Bhutan. You know, incredible that you were one of the first people to, to see that species and record it officially for over 10 years. Uh, genuinely incredible work. And uh, the other thing which will really stay with me is the difference between the Google searches for bat conservation and then bat removal. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely the wrong way around and we should be doing more, more to conserve bat species. Um, so I've got a few questions which have, have come in. So um, the first question which came in is from Diane. It says, how many baby bats will a female give birth to at one time? So 
Um, it is usually just one bat um, per, well, one offspring per bat each year. There are occasionally instances where we've seen bats give birth to twins, but this is pretty uncommon and it's even less common, sadly, for both of those individuals to survive. Um, if you think about um, how small some of the bats are that I showed you, obviously carrying another another bat um, whilst flying and, and sometimes they even carry the offspring um, after giving birth, so the the bat actually, the baby bat actually latches on um, to the teat and can stay attached that way. Um, it's really really heavy. Essentially, it can be you know a really significant proportion of their body weight to carry around as well. So that's why they kind of give birth to only one offspring at a time, because um, it's it's quite a lot of energy for them to expend. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I remember you say about that little fluffy grape. Um, you know, <laughs> what, what incredible species that was. Um, the, the second question that I've got is from Zoe Van Valsen. And she says, are there any diurnal species of bat or are they strictly nocturnal? That is a good question. Um, I don't know of any that are strictly diurnal, but there are certainly times when um, you get individuals of particular species that seem to be much more light tolerant. So some bats really hate coming out in even moonlight, whereas some bats are much more tolerant of that and can kind of use it to their advantage. Um, occasionally you do see bats flying around in the day and um, people tend to um, tag me in Facebook comments and stuff like that whenever people have spotted bats flying around in the day. So I know it definitely happens, but as a general rule, they, they are um, quite nocturnal. Yeah, quite strictly nocturnal. Fantastic. Uh, I did I did do a little bit of um, research whilst you were talking and I actually found um, there is a species of bat called the Blythe horseshoe bat uh, and apparently that does have a tendency for hunting during the day, which I thought was quite a significant coincidence that I share um, my surname with the name of that bat species. <laughs> um, uh, the next questions are about what people can do at, at home to help conserve and protect uh, bat species. Um, so Kelly Harrington asked, um, what's the best thing she can do other than put up her bat box to increase numbers in the area? And I know you mentioned uh, planting is really important. Can you just remind mm -hmm. people of the, the sort of types of plants they can uh, put out in their gardens to help uh, promote bats? Yeah, definitely. So um, anything that is essentially going to attract insects to your garden. So things that smell quite strongly, things that are particularly scented at night, which will attract things like moths and, and night flying um, flies. Um, in particular, things like tobacco and wisteria, or even better, if you can get your hands on some native um, plants like honeysuckle, um, all of those things will flower at night and therefore attract insects at night. Um, but in general, just having wild bits of your garden, things that aren't too heavily mown, all of that is good for insects and therefore good for bats. Yeah, absolutely. I remember uh, Chris Packham did uh, a bit of um, sort of a campaign a couple of years ago saying, you know, leave a little part of your garden unmowed, you know, and let it go a little bit wild. And that will actually, you know, attract a lot of insect species. And then consequently, uh, hopefully the bats will move in as well. Um, the, the next question is also about uh, bats in the garden here in the UK. And this is from Lucy Deards. And she says, how high does a bat box need to be? I would love one for Christmas. <laughs> I love that question. Um, so uh, typically the guidance is to put a bat box at least kind of three meters above ground. Um, and that is essentially re really to prevent disturbance by people. So if it's near your house or if it's in a public place where People might think, oh, what's that? And have a, have a little look in it, uh, which you want to avoid. Um, then, yeah, three metres is, is quite a good um, kind of position. However, bats definitely roost in features that are lower to the ground than that. And I've, I've heard kind of stories of bats coming out of uh, trees that are kind of have holes in that are only maybe half a metre above ground. So um, if you can't get it that high, don't worry too much. The best thing to do is to put it up and um, yeah, just, just see. Um, once you do put a bat box up, it's quite important to remember not to disturb it because that would need um, a legal license. Um, but if you, if you have a little look online, there's, there's a lot of guidance out there about the best place to put your bat box, what kind of aspect, what kind of height, um, and that, that's all um, on the Bat Conservation Trust website. Yeah, 
Uh, absolutely. And um, we've got another question in uh, here. It says, how did your, uh, this is from Melissa Donnelly. Melissa said, how did your field work in Indonesia compare to other places you've worked? Oh, that's a nice question as well. Um, so I really loved working in Indonesia just because um, the bats were so prevalent there. Um, even though they are threatened, they're still absolutely everywhere. Every single time you go out at night, if you have a bat detector or if you've just got keen eyesight, um, you will see bats um, and all different types. Um, so that was something I really enjoyed. But um, I have also worked in areas like Honduras and South Africa, um, where um, I've seen really amazing bat species as well. Um, so the kind of message that I would say is there, there are bat, amazing bat species all over the world. And I think that's one of the reasons that I love bats is you find them in nearly every single environment. Um, so yeah, wherever you go, there's, there's interesting bats to kind of see and hear. Brilliant. And I'll ask you uh, one final question. And there's one, one for me as well. Um, so which, which bat has the largest wingspan? That is a good question. Um, so I believe it's kind of one of those questions where there's always like a few different answers when you look it up online. But um, I believe there is a giant uh, crown flying fox and also the Madagascar flying fox. So both really large fruit eating bats um, that have wingspans of around six foot. Um, so they're kind of their their body height would not be as tall as a human, but their actual wingspan is is you know, taller than me, basically. Um, so yeah, those are those are some of the really kind of possibly intimidating looking, but when you get up close, you realize that they're just kind of little puppies with wings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever described as that before, um, but you mentioned earlier um, when you're talking about the role that zoos play in safeguarding bat species about the fantastic work, which the um, Zoological Society of Bristol have done to safeguard um, bat species. I know in their Livingston's fruit bat exhibit, they have a really good educational display where they have uh, the wingspan of the Livingston's fruit bat sort of mapped out for you to have a picture alongside. And it's a really, really impressive span, uh, I'll be honest. Um, so a question for me just about the, the general development of Heart of England Wildlife Park. Uh, this is from Ross Gandhi. He says, how confident are you about getting planning permission? Um, to, to be honest, Ross, very confident. Um, whether that's at our preferred site or another site, one of the contingency sites, um, I don't know. But obviously, we're working with professionals, you know, ecologists like Livy, um, planning officers. We're working with archaeologists and working with flood um, risk assessors you know, to make sure that we have the best possible chance of getting planning permission. Uh, and ultimately, the site which we eventually do submit the planning application for, hopefully in the near future, um, we wouldn't submit it if we didn't believe that we had a good good chance of getting that planning permission. Um, so we'll work with all the experts, we'll be guided by them to make sure that we can open our doors to our supporters and our, our guests and to you know fellow conservationists as soon as possible. Uh, but it's a really good question, Ross. And I would just say, you know, keep uh, an eye out on our uh, Facebook channels and obviously, you know, Twitter, Instagram, and we'll continue to put out regular updates uh, about our development so you can see the full journey of Heart of England Wildlife Park from concept to conservation. Uh, Libby, once again, I just want to thank you. You know, it's an incredibly uh, insightful talk. I know that you're off now to rescue a little hedgehog with a, a broken leg, which is a very... That's right. <laughs> yeah, very admirable and altruistic thing to do and, you know, testament to your dedication and uh, outstanding effort as an ecologist and I just want to thank all of our supporters who have joined us uh, this evening for this conservation talk like I said the comments that we've seen coming through have been absolutely fantastic and as always my phone's uh, constantly going off with sort of text messages um, you know just confirming it's been a really insightful uh, and well received talk I just want to wish everybody a very happy and safe Halloween and we'll see you at the next conservation talk in the near future thank you